Okay, we're good. The stream is up. Awesome. Well said before, thank you to everyone in the room today for joining us. Uh, thank you to Juan. Um, I, I, I know we're all excited to sort of see how this goes, but I'll, I'll give you a second to introduce yourself. You want to take it away? This is the official HackFS brainstorming session. Yeah, awesome. Well, hey, it's really great to be here with everybody. Uh, what I think we ran one of these brainstorming sessions uh, a year ago, so really excited to generate a bunch of ideas together. Um, it's Fantastic to have another uh, HackFS. So what I'm going to do today is um, we're going to spend most of the time uh, in this kind of generative session, just um, brainstorming ideas. And in order to do that, we'll look at a bunch of other ideas from the past. We'll actually pull up the old document that we generated, uh, that a lot of us generated a year ago with a bunch of uh, cool ideas. And we'll add a lot more. Um, and hopefully that will um, help kind of percolate uh, some interesting opportunities for uh, for people. And uh, uh, yeah, I, by the way, look, I don't know if you wanted to cover anything else. I, you told me to introduce myself and I didn't introduce myself. I started jumping in. So let me know if you want. No, that's perfect. Okay, sweet. All good. All good. Um, uh, cool. So let's see, I will share my screen. And uh, yeah, so like the, the goal of the session is to kind of make it uh, super interactive um, and I'm going to go through a few um, things first. Let's see. Let me know if you can see that. Which screen can you see? You can see both right now. So I've got your desktop and the uh, slides. Let's see. Um, one second. So you can see this um, with the browser, right? That's and, correct. Great, awesome. So I'll uh, just quickly go through a few uh, slides um, just to kind of like set the uh, set context a little bit. Um, cool. So. Uh, I'm just gonna kick off with a bit of inspiration. I'll try to give a, a lot of tips for the hackers. Uh, and uh, I wanna talk a bit about uh, something I get a lot of questions about, which is how to start up in Web3. Um, this is just gonna be a super quick summary of another talk I've given at another uh, global um, uh, summit uh, called, uh, I think, Web3 Weekend. And so it's just kind of a plug for that. Um, you can kind of watch that talk to for the full version, but there's a few nuggets here that keep coming up again and again and again when I talk to people. And uh, then we're going to spend most of the time in this kind of open-ended brainstorming brainstorming session. Uh, cool. So just quick inspiration. Um, it, it's really useful to in when you're setting off to build uh, something and, and kind of entering one of these hackathons. Uh, I, I find it really nice and, and, and useful to kind of step back and think through why Web3 matters and when we're all here building, uh, building what we're building and kind of how to use your superpowers as a, as a builder, as a, as a um, uh, developer, as a designer, as a product maker, um, uh, as a speaker and so on uh, to kind of make an impact. And so, you know, I, I really see Web3 as the next generation of the internet. So the internet has been um, coming in, in multiple waves uh, over time and Web3 is this um, big, uh, big kind of next, next wave. And you know it's kind of breathtaking, but in about 80 years, computing has completely changed our species. Uh, what we can do nowadays with our superpowers, uh, kind of with you know, our, our supercomputers in our pockets and this massive connectivity that, that brings us all together, um, it's just fundamentally very different than, than what our ancestors were able to do. And you, know, you don't even have to kind of think back 500 years or 1,000 years or 2,000 years um, to just kind of uh, just even 80 years before the rise of computing, um, people operated very differently. And so you as a, as a human today have just vastly more uh, capabilities because you're, you have this uh, kind of set of superpowers that are, that are um, delivered to you through, through this, uh, this computational medium. And what I find most exciting about this system is that you, know, you, you get to um, contribute to it too. As you can think of you know, humanity today as not just um, uh, 
you can think of Kubernetes today as like living through this integrated system with you know, trillions of computers. So, so you can think of everything that billions of humans can do, plus uh, their uh, leveraged, um, well-applied efforts uh, mediated by trillions of computers living and working together in this sort of massive integrated system. And you know, every single facet of, of um, what we do as, uh, as humans tends to be now affected in one way or another through by computing, even if not directly, um, just indirectly through the effect of computing in our in our uh, in our systems, in our in our economies, in our in our larger kind of intersubjective systems. And um, you know, at the end of the day, all of what computing gives us is this um, super open platform through which you can craft a superpower and deliver it to the world. So you can think of the internet and the web as this superpower crafting machine where you get to kind of uh, 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 create a spell, uh, like, you know, use kind of like this arcane language, craft, use this magic, craft a spell, um, and then form a superpower and, and deliver it to uh, billions of people worldwide at, at a you know, near zero cost. It's not zero, but it's it's near zero cost. And that's just uh, absolutely uh, you know, breathtaking in terms of our capabilities as a species. And so that means that over the last 20 years, um, we've been kind of radically improving ourselves through through systems like this uh, with all kinds of super powerful uh, components. And the really amazing thing, like the thing that I find most promising and optimistic about this entire outlook is that this is super um, uh, open for innovation. Uh, it is very easy for uh, you know, an individual or even you know, a small group of people to uh, put their efforts into making a thing and deploying it to the to the world, and you know if it's something that a lot of other people resonate with and want to use and so on, then it'll get traction and grow and and so on. And so you know just even in the slide, you can probably see a lot of different kinds of systems that have um, radically uh, changed how how you operate and and so on. Uh, I think the collaboration tools are just this phenomenal set of set of um, superpowers that you can use to kind of do all kinds of things. I'd love to see a bunch of these things. So, so even in the screen, most of the stuff, not all of it, but most of it is Web2 stuff. And I would love to be able to, over time, just kind of start swapping out uh, all of this for, for Web3 through, web through powered, powered things. Um, and I think we're, we're you know, fairly, close, uh, fairly close to that. Uh, you know, it's also worth mentioning for everybody here that you know, computing has a lot of other kind of revolutions that are coming uh, ahead, and some of them in parallel and so on. There's many new kinds of interfaces that are coming. So AR and VR, uh, brain machine interfaces, and different kind of AI systems. Um, so you know, when 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 you think about sort of the computing timeline, 80 years back and 80 years in the future, it's it's really unclear what's going to happen um, over this this trajectory. So um, you know, really encourage you to to stay at the uh, forefront of uh, of computing and stay kind of um, aim for good good futures. A lot of this technology, just you have to remember that. Technology is doing, it has this um, great, powerful capability, and that means that people can use it for good or for bad. Um, and you know, even bad is kind of like hard to define because what's good for one group can be bad for others, and so on. But uh, I think that there are a lot of things that you know, intersubjectively, like for most people on the uh, on the planet, could be uh, things you can aim for good or, or or bad things. And so, really, the the power is in your hands as builders to. Um, craft the future that you want to craft a really good future. So uh, over time, um, use hackathons like these to, uh, to build, to help chip, chip add um, building the future that, that, that you want to live in. Let's see. Um, so now in Web3, uh, you know, I think it's really important for folks to uh, think through the values of, of Web3. So uh, we come from like the read, write interactive web, uh, the sort of like the Web2 world. And we've been adding kind of verifiability and trustlessness and so on to, to Web3. And I tend to think of this as you know, this kind of set of values of being able to kind of um, create these notions of rights and bake them into the, into the network. This is a, a uh, uh, I'm starting to see sort of the blockchain systems as like a jurisdiction within, within, the, uh, within the internet. And like, that's a totally different, different kind of thing. Like you, you can think of blockchains as this kind of legal system in a box. And Web3 is uh, you know, really changing every single industry that you can look at. Um, there's all kinds of systems that are being developed. Um, you know, it still hasn't, uh, a, a lot of our products and applications haven't really uh, permeated the, uh, the mainstream. And so 
Web3 has uh, is sort of like kind of slow, um, slower than other than other uh, revolutions kind of spread. So I think like mobile and social networks ended up being way faster. Um, but you can, every single industry segment is getting getting radically changed by by Web3. Oh, by the way, the, the reason why I think all this stuff is slow is that the infrastructure Web3 is fundamentally very different. And we've had to do a ton of infrastructure build out. Plus, what tends to happen is that a lot of teams end up getting distracted by uh, a lot of teams that set out to build really high quality consumer products end up being distracted and sucked into some important infrastructure project or um, into some financial project. And so that means that a lot of the things that end up getting built out of Web3 are either infrastructure or financial products. Um, and I think it would be fantastic if, if the teams, you know, if, if you go and hack on something that is a consumer uh, product, you know, really stick with it, like really help. Because um, at the end of the day, most people use um, these superpowers through some uh, end user consumer product that that, um, that has like some you know nice interface that people can can use and whatnot. So all of that will get better um, only if you as a team uh, stick through through things like that and, and, and build those kinds of components. Uh, you know, one uh, thing that, it, that I'd love to, for you to keep in mind with all of this is that software is eating mechanism design. So that's kind of what all of Web three is is uh, um, is really about. Is it's just that you can create incentive structures and deploy them out into the world and and um, and and if they make sense and they're and they can uh, have like a like a they can scale and so on then they'll uh, all, all kinds of things will will change through the threat and you know just to convince you of the the power of these these mechanisms you know the Bitcoin network um, is a good example and, and like always a stark reminder of just how powerful mechanisms are uh, the this enormous amount of, of hash rate and, and all of the Bitcoin mining uh, efforts in the world are yielded by you know a few mechanisms. Uh, and and you know the the Falcon network is a, is another good example of this where um, just a few mechanisms uh, deployed into the network uh, can cause like the world's uh, you know one of the largest storage networks on the planet uh, to emerge in like a really you know short time. So uh, Falcon isn't even a year old yet um, in terms of you know when minute launch uh, happened and already uh, it's one of like the largest storage systems on the planet, um, and you know this is uh, the capacity of Falcon now. Just in in kind of about, I think it's, it, even this graph. Every time I like look at this graph, uh, it, you know, I have to get a get a new new snapshot. Um, we can now, you know, just to put into context how much an eight eight exabytes is, or like you know when we hit ten exabytes, um, you know this is like a like a an estimate of the size of a bunch of different. Uh, different kinds of data sets and what they might, how big they might be. And, um, you know, kind of uh, this estimate was on using publicly available data and then kind of estimating the growth rate and kind of looking at what them, them might look like. But, you know, all the things kind of highlighted in blue could just entirely fit in, uh, in, a, in this kind of storage. Uh, cool. So I think let me make it through. So the, the, and, I had this slice here because you know what what um I how I approached the question of, of Web3 and, and kind of changing the, the network was um I looked at a lot of the, the pieces that, that I thought were kind of broken about the internet and kind of tried creating some projects um uh, to help with them. So one of them was uh kind of around networking and uh, said, hey, like you know, building things with with peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networks is, is really difficult. Like it'd be really amazing to kind of create a composable framework for. Um, uh, for being able to kind of write peer 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 systems, and you know, uh, and we kind of emphasize that as a hacker, if you build something that's composable and, and that a lot of people can build on, and that is open and open source uh, in the first place, um, then a lot of people might might end up uh, using it. And you know, with things like IPFS and, and Falcon, like uh, it's it's about changing the the nature of how data moves uh, and putting sort of people's uh, people's control. Uh, first and foremost in, in the distribution of data. Cool, so some quick tips for, for hackers. So um, not a lot of people know this, but uh, I started off building a lot of things through hackathons. Uh, so in fact, I started my um, first set of projects by uh, working through hackathons and, and kind of, I, I always kind of was really excited about building things and getting to hang out with a lot of other people and, and um, uh, being able to to uh, talk about what what I was building and what I was interested in and so on, and I just learned a ton through it. So I think my my first step is 
use hackathons as a, as a great excuse to build something that is going to teach you a lot and, and through it kind of explore some domain, explore some area of, of things. And so, you know, don't be, don't be shy about um, building a thing, even if uh, you don't see kind of like a, uh, a long-term future for it. Uh, you might learn a ton and all of what you learn there might, might feed into something else. Uh, you know, tip number two is like sometimes, uh, you know, one of those projects that you build in a hackathon does have a ton of potential to, to grow from, from there. Um, and so you kind of, you know, as you build things uh, and you participate in, in hackathons over time, um, you know, kind of time it and, and maybe one of those things uh, might be really compelling. Uh, and sometimes it's not even um, a project that you started. Sometimes you'll find a project that somebody else started and um, out of a hackathon and, and you'll get really excited about it. And uh, you'll be like, oh, wow, that's actually really cool. And maybe you can join that team and, and go uh, take it somewhere. Uh, you know, another thing that I think is really important for hackathons is uh, keep things small and simple. So uh, it's always kind of really exciting to when you're building something new to just think of adding a lot of different kinds of things and making the thing you're making um, solve every problem. And the number one thing to remember is you have a very limited amount of time. You know, even even a month is is a long time, but but you know, it goes by really fast and um, your limited time is gonna be best spent by, uh, by getting the core functionality of the thing working well enough um, and just kind of polish that, that piece. So uh, kind of like the typical uh, YC advice is just make something that like a few people love uh, and that's way better than making something that a lot of people might like a little bit. Um, and so really kind of like focus on solving one problem for somebody um, and then uh, you know, that, that small, simple thing can then grow from there. Uh, one really cool thing about Web3 uh, that you can lean in, into is the composability of, of, the, um, of the Web3 stack. It means that you can create simple things that are just kind of some composable piece of software or some composable set of contracts on a chain or something like that. And then that in, a, in and of itself can then be built on by a lot of other people. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, you don't have to build a lot of very complex things. Sometimes the, the more complex platforms and systems don't succeed and it's the simpler, more composable primitives that end up taking off. I think the, the recent successes of, um, of DeFi and NFTs are a great example of this. Like the platforms that, be, that uh, aim for simpler, more composable things ended up having a much larger impact than, than I think um, platforms that sort of sought to kind of encapsulate everything. Um, and yeah, I think like uh, throughout the hackathon, just kind of ask questions, uh, lean on on folks. Uh, uh, there's a ton of material and content out there that you can that you can look at. Uh, a ton of stuff on the web, a ton of stuff on chat. Um, you know, really kind of uh, don't get blocked by struggling through something. Um, you can lean on asking for help and or searching for resources and and stuff like that. Uh, cool. So. Um, a few thoughts on like, you know, starting up in, in Web3. A lot of people uh, come to hackathons and, and build things and eventually kind of want to take one of their hacks and, and turn those into kind of a high impact project. Um, and, you know, for those people, um, a lot of people tend to ask me uh, what it's like to, to, to start things up in, in this ecosystem and, and so on. So I kind of want to boil it down to uh, three points. And this is something that I expanded on another uh, talk. Um, and so you, you can find it online. So I'll just very quickly give a, give a summary of it here, but you, know, you can watch that talk for a more expanded version. So you know, point number one is that the opportunities in Web3 are truly massive. Uh, point number two is that building Web3 is quite challenging or can be, uh, it's getting easier every year, but it can be pretty challenging. And point number three is that we're here to help. So a lot of groups are super, um, super friendly, super collaborative, super um, uh, able to kind of help save you time. And I'm really excited to do it because people have helped them in the past. And so everybody's sort of paying it forward. So it's a super collaborative community. Uh, and so kind of remember, remember that, uh, you know, kind of like in terms of the opportunities being massive, you know, remember software is getting law. And in terms of the challenges, um, you know, there's a ton of complexity. And, you know, the, the also the, the, the space moves extremely fast. So if you kind of, Stop paying attention quickly, like the, the world moves really fast. Um, all kinds of challenges. And yeah, like we're, we're here to help. So, you know, the, a lot of the community is putting, um, there's a ton of resources that I'm sure you've, you've encountered in the past. Uh, a lot of platforms that make it easier to, to get started. Um, and uh, 
there's a ton of orgs that that are you know explicitly devoting a lot of resources to helping others get started and and kind of build things in in the world of Web three. Um, you know, really kind of want to make sure that uh, over time you feel super able to kind of reach out for for help. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, and and for the folks that that uh, want to go on and take the project that they that they build, uh, just sort of like my my recommended pathway. Um, try building things through hackathons um, until you feel like you have like the kernel or something that could be uh, could be fairly large, and you because know, there's a lot of hackathons going on all the time, so you can you can probably kind of um, try and experiment with them over time. And then once you have something that like you feel like it, it can grow fairly large, there's actually a lot of funding available in the in the Web3 ecosystem to get started. So there's things like prizes that come through hackathons, there's next step grants, there's accelerators, and then um, investments and grants beyond that. So there's a whole funding funnel that's been um, set up that once you feel like you have something um, pretty, pretty promising, you can, um, you know, you're able to find a, a uh, funding, either you know grants or or investments that can help you um, uh, uh, be able to kind of work on your project full time or help help you hire other people so they can they can help you uh, work on it and so on. And you know, highly uh, recommend taking a look at how Web three is changing teams. So a lot of different groups are um, now instead of kind of forming companies and so on, uh, building DAOs and building other kinds of uh, internet native or crypto native team structures. And those are super interesting, super exciting. Um, and yeah, I would say the other component is a lot of groups offer, um, at least uh, a lot of people at uh, PL, but I, but I think a lot of other folks in other organizations are starting, starting to do it too. Uh, a lot of people offer office hours. So that kind of stuff can be super helpful where like if you're stuck with um, product questions or um, uh, technical questions, or uh, you're trying to think of like um, some kind of like economic flow model or mechanism design or something like that, office hours can be a phenomenal way to kind of get some hands-on help thinking through some of these problems. So um, if that's something that would be interesting, um, this is something that that uh, uh, folks from PLN and from other orgs can, can probably put help help do. And there's a lot of workshops that will happen over uh, the whole Hackathon um, uh, uh, set of sessions. So definitely lean into those. Um, but I think, yeah, office hours can always be useful to kind of plug into, into you know, kind of direct uh, help for what you're working on. Cool. So great. Let's get to hackathon ideas. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open a shared document that we used together last year, and this comes from a session. I'm gonna send the link to everybody. Let's see. So you just open that link and you'll we'll, you'll hop into this chat together. Sorry, into this uh, yeah chat chat through documents. Um, and this is the brainstorm session document from a year ago, like almost to the day. But, uh, I guess a little bit a little bit over a year ago. Um, yeah, I guess a month. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna go over the rules a little bit. Uh, in, in a moment of kind of like what the, the session is gonna, um, it's gonna be about. And then we're gonna go through kind of this whole, um, we're gonna have some time to kind of put in a lot of ideas and so on as a, as a group. And then we'll, we'll take some time going through each of these sections, um, kind of adding and looking at some of these ideas. And the whole goal is to kind of treat, treat this as a super generative um, discussion. Uh, and you know, now that I've spent like 30 minutes like blathering at you, um, we're gonna, uh, it, it, the goal is to kind of make this super interactive um, and uh, kind of work through a bunch of these, these categories to just generate more ideas. And so the goal is to kind of over time build this just like really nice idea base. Um, and you know, it's really cool that a bunch of the things here from last year ended up getting built. Some of them turned into, into Full, full on projects that that uh, are live now and some of them have a ton of users and, and so on. So it's pretty pretty amazing to see um, that, that growth. And a lot of these ideas remain um, super viable uh, today. So uh, pretty interesting that like we started hitting on a bunch of like the audio and video 
stuff that like NFTs weren't as much of a thing. It was like a little bit of a thing, but you know, definitely not the the big um, boom hadn't really hit yet. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll get to that in a moment. So I'll um uh yeah, actually, if folks are around, if you can turn your video on, that'd be cool. Like it'd help us all like see each other and actually participate and and whatnot. Cool. How's it going? Great to see you. Sweet. I am not just speaking into the ether. Uh, I'm speaking to people. Uh, cool. So the uh, I want to go through the the rules. So first off, yes and. Uh, who can explain the yes and rule of brainstorming? Anyone want to give it a go? Well, anything you hear, uh, you first say yes uh, without doing any judgment, and then add on to that what else we can do. That's a standard in the improv type of scenario. Exactly. Um, awesome. Very well put. And and why is it important to be uh, to say yes and and be generative? Again, you don't want to block your uh, block that thought. You want to let it percolate. Yeah, you want to, yeah. So the um, yes, and uh, it turns out that in highly uh, technical settings, um, it tends to be that a lot of the sort of engineering mindset tends to be uh, more constraining. It tends to to want to figure out why certain things are not gonna are not gonna work. So a lot of people that build uh, software and so on tend to come into discussions and in brainstorm with a sort of bias towards figuring out why it won't work. And right away, a lot of people kind of race, uh, when, when they hear a suggestion, race into thinking about why that thing isn't gonna work. And um, they tend to say, no, that won't work because of X. And, but what happens is that when somebody says no to, to a thing, when somebody proposes something, they suggest an idea, um, there's kind of like a leap of faith. And in, in a room you know, or a document with a lot of people, um, that suggestion, um, when, when you hear a no, that sort of like shuts down the creativity. Uh, and so hearing no from other people and so on tends to be like a like a creative creativity killer. So if you if any of you have, I love that you mentioned improv and this is where the, the rule comes from. Um, if you haven't done improv, highly recommend you do. And, and in this setting, you can usually uh, improv classes will show you a an amazing example of what happens when in a scene people reject each other's ideas and say no, which is like completely becomes dead and uh, not interesting and so on. So likewise, in brainstorming sessions with a lot of groups, um, very much be uh, yes and oriented, be generative, uh, come up with more things, and and you know don't be um, yeah like a, like uh, copy remix, um, you know look at other things, uh, and then if you can think of like something that's slightly different or like has an interesting twist, write it down and and so on. Uh, who knows? Maybe you doing that will bring attention to somebody else, and and they'll they'll make something cool. Uh, great. So before we jump into this set of ideas, uh, and we'll kind of like go go through them, um, I want to kind of run through some. I want to flash like some um, images at you that I've been collecting for a while. The last time I presented these was at a hackathon at ETC a few weeks ago. I guess last week feels like forever ago. Here I plug the the Hackathon list from a long time ago. Uh, so in this in this list, I talked a bit about uh, storage markets, data, data and computation, infrastructure, and then, and there's a lot of interest in NFTs. So I had a bunch of stuff on NFTs there. Uh, so I'll just go through those uh, uh, pretty quickly. So think of um, being able to have uh, storage markets with a lot of kind of asks and bids on both sides, and auctions and live orders and so on. Um, think of a, a there's, there's a thing called like sort of like the dataverse that people are coming up with, which is um, being able to kind of add smart contracts and oracles uh, with data, data that's large, and starting to kind of compute over uh, over the data that's stored in in, uh, uh, in in storage networks. There's a bunch of different kinds of markets that could be involved in the storage of data. So things like um, auction houses and marketplaces and so on. 
there's uh, you know connections and bridges to other networks and other chains. Um, you know, think of like a marketplace like Airbnb, but imagine if this was showing you not a place you're going to stay, but a place where your data is going to stay. So imagine like kind of like a marketplace with pictures of all of the different facilities that storage providers might be might be offering. Um, this one I'll kind of talk a little bit more about because it's probably my uh, my favorite idea, and I think something that I think is could be super super valuable. Um, so it turns out that right now um, Filecoin has like this really unique incentive structure uh, that that creates a um, a condition by which you can drop the price to zero or turn it negative. And I think uh, I think there's folks already uh, at Texas. I don't know if you, you talked about it uh, yet, but like I think they're they're seeing this in action. So it turns out that you can um, if you auction uh, because there's a lot more capacity than than storage. So like the the Block reward of five is incentivizing a lot of capacity build up, and the, the the clients are sort of starting to take off, but like they're the, the amount of store, store data is lower than the capacity. Uh, while that's true, uh, and that can be true for a while, it could be many months or years. While that's true, it means that you can turn data storage, um, you, you can make it free, or potentially do negative storage pricing. Uh, so you could um, cause uh, storage providers to offer storage either for free or paying some of the clients. And like, that's a phenomenal, interesting, super interesting uh, incentive structure that's available. And my sense of like what's missing to be able to, to, uh, to really kind of do that in earnest is like um, the, the tooling for auctions is now, uh, exists now. I think uh, Textile has been building it. Uh, and the tooling for um, auctions and NFTs exists because there's a lot of NFT auction houses what doesn't exist yet is something that puts these things together and says, what would happen if you kind of auction some very large scale deal um, that was like really valuable. Um, you know, imagine kind of like some really important data set like this kind of, uh, this weather forecast data that, that might be extremely useful to, uh, uh, for a lot of people that you know, might be really big. Um, and then some organization came to uh, sell the right to store that data to the Falcon network, to miners in the Falcon network. And Falcon miners kind of applied to like bid on that on that deal, you know, decreasing the price until kind of like it goes negative. Uh, and then suddenly kind of inverting the, the flow and suddenly paying for um, the right to store that data. So I think that this is possible. And so there's kind of like one really high quality auction house away from just this kind of incentive structure that might uh, make um, a lot of organizations that have super valuable precious data that the world uh, really wants to store, uh, be able to get funded by the value of the data they generate, which is super interesting. Um, so I, I would love to see kind of like, you know, if, if there's like one thing that I'd love to see out of this hackathon is storage auction houses. Um, and you can think of like, you know, coupling to that, like all kinds of requirements that clients might have around certification for the storage or something like that. Uh, there's another kind of interesting idea around data DAOs, which is um, if you have DAOs, um, could you create the stewarding of a data set through a DAO and kind of over time collaborate on and decide on what you keep, what you store, and so on, and kind of curate data sets through on chain governance? Uh, I think a few people are experimenting with that, but like I don't think uh, it has uh, emerged yet. And you can, you know, think of also coupling this with a lot of the um, governance tooling that, that is emerging in the, in the network. Uh, think also of, uh, of like end user, really nice end user products, things like um, the, uh, Slate, which is a kind of a, a, a tool for gathering a lot of content from the web and being able to, to display it. Uh, think of a ton of photo archives. You can now store all of this kind of stuff in, in IPFS and Falcoin through, and, and through things like Web3 storage and whatnot. Uh, think of uh, social apps. Uh, I think you can finally build these things. Like this has been the the one of the grails of Web three for a long time. Like being able to kind of build uh, uh, social media type applications in Web three. Uh, there's a few out there um, that are kind of getting going, but have always kind of struggled. Now that you can store all of this data uh, for free or potentially being paid for it, um, I think this stuff is is much more viable. You can think of stock photo or video archives. Um, think of open access science platforms where all the data could be um, backed up and, and replicated for 
uh, for free, um, and so on. And then you can get into interesting kind of uses of computation alongside the data. So you can start building things that enable you to attach some computation close to the data. Uh, so think of kind of passing, um, uh, adding, since a lot of Aqua Managers out there have a bunch of storage plus a lot of GPUs. So imagine being able to kind of um, sell some of the computation that, uh, sell some computation over the data that, that people are storing. There's some hard problems here around making it verifiable, but I, I think that even at the beginning, there's all kinds of use cases where uh, you can ride for a while on, on, um, on kind of uh, reputation systems. Uh, something useful is also kind of like think of your favorite set of applications. Think is there like a good Web3 alternative and you know, go through like how hard would it be to build uh, something like that on, on Web3. And then as developers, uh, if you're really into kind of developer tooling, think of all kinds of things that might be, um, that you might be able to, might want to store or replicate or distribute through uh, systems like this. So, you know, package managers, containers, VMs, all of this kind of stuff could now um, be, be stored this way. Uh, potentially this stuff could be, could couple well with, with, uh, with NFTs. Um, I don't know if people have done that, but like package managers were like each package is an NFT. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good idea. Um, cool. So some interesting thoughts about NFTs. So I think the, you know, one of the things that hasn't really happened yet is that, um, NFTs are not yet a productive asset. Um, and that's because NFTs don't give the rights of, um, of the art. Uh, and so owners of an NFT can't really kind of uh, use the art. Um, but I think it's kind of like a misalignment of incentives. I think if people, um, uh, if people made uh, NFT rights transferred with the NFTs, then that would kind of put the onus on the holder to make that art productive. And because of the NFT uh, payment flows, the artist would also get compensated. So I think something like that would be potentially really valuable. Um, it would sort of make a lot of the NFT work, uh, artwork um, uh, likely much, like, uh, much more likely to be productive. And so that means that the value of these, of, of these assets might, might go up. Um, also, I think like we're starting to see dynamic NFTs, uh, but uh, the stuff is pretty basic still. Um, I think over time we're gonna get kind of like full, uh, full kind of like three D environments um, as NFTs themselves. So a lot of people are already building three D style worlds, but what if you could create composable rooms? So imagine if you could build um, a three D room as an NFT itself, and potentially that could be a gallery in which you host other NFTs. And then you would be able to kind of compose those rooms with other rooms. And so you can start kind of building the metaverse over time in pieces. So I think, I think the metaverse has um, begun already. It's just kind of all in pieces and it'll be sort of put together room by room and then stitched together into galleries and museums and then houses and so on. Yeah, think of like level editors and whatnot and think of like thinking of that as or com that composition as itself as, a, as an NFT. Uh, there's also video now. You can do video and media, uh, other kind of media uh, things as NFTs. Um, the folks at VideoCoin have made like this really cool video NFT uh, structure where you can um, now do like all of the transcoding um, to deliver really high quality uh, web video through um, uh, through uh, VideoCoin and, and Falcoin. And they've kind of like done, done a prototype uh, auction house too, which is super cool. And so, you know, if, imagine being able to use that stuff for other, all kinds of like video style apps. So think of like TikTok or Vine or things like that and, and make them kind of Web3, Web3 native. Um, you could also do kind of like pay-per-view media. Uh, this is also something that, that a lot of folks are, uh, are working on already, but I think uh, there's still a lot of open, open possibilities there. And, and, and also think of like uh, all kinds of social video applications where you can maybe store the video or like edit the video in some way or, you know, transcode it or um, translate it or, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, by the way, plug on Huddle. Huddle was a Hackathon's uh, uh, team. So that's uh, where they got this started. It was pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, one area that I'm super excited for is uh, science NFTs. So a lot of scientists are starting to kind of think about um, NFTs as well. And kind of there's, it's beginning with selling 
uh, selling the science artifacts of science as art, uh, but I'm more excited about treating the actual individual pieces of science, like the actual things like the experiments or the figures or the papers and so on as actual artifacts on chain that you can reason about and you can sort of start propagating value flows through. So propagating value flows. So um, uh, uh, the mirror team uh, created a thing called splits uh, that you can use to kind of split the value that goes into one and the field, which means that you can start forming uh, networks of splits. And you can, uh, there's a project called split stream that's focused on um, science and NFTs uh, where you can kind of think of funding the, the contribution graph um, through kind of splits like this, which I think could be, could be really cool. Uh, and just think of like all of the different uh, artifacts that are part of the scientific process um, as, as something that could be could be put together into a into a um, into a network. Uh, and then you know if you start putting together the, these contribution networks over time and in the larger scale, you can think of kind of attribution over lo larger and larger uh, components. So things like source grant and so on could be uh, could be involved. So think of like the NFT. Um, I, th I think there's not enough tooling right now for for all this NFT stuff. It would be really cool to be able to kind of create distribution graphs for um, all of the parties involved with production of an asset or, or uh, maintenance of an asset and, and kind of like be able to reward them as that asset trades hands. So think of like, not just one artist, but like all of the, you know, think like the art school that helped that artist get started, or if it's a scientific work, all of the authors or um, the citations that they make and, and so on. Um, and yeah, I think a certificates of impact is also like a really interesting idea that uh, I think is now doable through NFTs. I would, um, this is one of the things that I think could have the highest impact um, out of the entire NFT um, market right now. I think if uh, somebody did like a really high quality implementation of a certificate of impact as NFTs and made it like a really valuable market, it would allow the kind of funding in the future of super valuable, super valuable work. Um, you know, this is kind of like a, use crypto for good type of type of um, idea. Uh, and then of course with NFTs, all kinds of games are, are viable. Now that you have a lot of storage, you can create entire uh, environments. You can look at all sorts of open source games that are out there that have a ton of assets and uh, add them to add them to things like Hyperfest and Falcon and then address them to be able to kind of use them in, in, a, in a Web3 game. Um, or think of kind of creating, you can create a virtual world. So there's a few around, but like, I think that the you know if you think of the world of games and the world of like games in Web three, it's it's you know the Web three games are like very few still. There's a ton of possibilities uh, that are super wide open. So uh, if you like games, uh, definitely like a, a time to to play with all of this stuff. Um, and so I think you know really kind of like metaverse type things are going to be uh, super interesting. Cool. So hopefully that was that jostled some ideas. Uh, let's let let's go through this talk together. Uh, so I'll give, um, I'll just kind of like scroll through this briefly and then we'll give like five minutes for you to kind of find an area that you find interesting and just write a few ideas out there. Um, and as you drop something and you see some other people kind of working through this, um, yeah, feel free to comment on things or um, plus one things or add hearts if you find it valuable. Um, I think comments could be could be really useful because then uh, other people might get ideas or like come back to it'll like flag an idea for them. Uh, I'm hearing some questions. So uh, possible to get access to this presentation by chance? Yeah, uh, I will um, send the the keynote files afterwards. Um, uh, somebody looking for a team? Uh, yeah, I think uh, other folks probably on chat uh, might find you. Um, can I elaborate on the certificates of impact from implementation perspective? Yeah, totally. So uh, certificates of impact are this idea um, from a few years ago um, from the effective altruist commu community uh, that says that you can create a, like, imagine that you do something good for the world and you create a certificate of you having done that good thing for the world. And imagine that you now uh, sell the certificate in a market. Um, to sell the credit of having done that good thing. Uh, what that means is that you can now fund, retroactively fund good works. So usually good works can only be funded ahead of time. So think of grants or um, 
kind of like charities and so on. Like all of that kind of stuff is, is a way of funding good works ahead of time uh, before they happen. But sometimes um, you don't quite know what will be good or really valuable until after it happens. And so it would be really, really useful to be able to kind of fund and reward good works in the world after they happen. Uh, and so certificates of impact are an idea for being able to do that, which is imagine being able to kind of create a, an NFT that um, addresses a, um, as a, as some kind of impact. And then the idea is that the person who did that good work describes that good work in, in a certificate um, and then kind of sells it. Now this kind of raises all kinds of questions around verifiability, like spam, like what happens with kind of a lot of bogus good works, like how do you know that it, it really happened and so on. Um, you know, for, for like really big things, it might be pretty pretty obvious and the spam problem might not be, not, might not be high. Um, and in some areas it might be verifiable. So for example, if people sell certificates of impact for planting trees, as an example, uh, that might be something that people could go and verify. Um, so it's kind of like carbon credits. You can think of carbon credits as like a, a specific implementation of a certificate of impact. Um, and the certificate of impact being a much larger, more broad uh, kind of thing. Um, but if, if there was kind of like a very large market for, some, for things like this, then this would be a way of kind of um, coupling, you know, using economic tools for achieving a lot of good, good in the world. Uh, in terms of implementation, I really think like what's missing here is a super high quality auction house again. So if you look at, um, you know, things like, Foundation, or Rival, um, and so on. Like, what makes, um, I think what made NFTs work is that you had like this kind of like really high quality experience in a product um, that you could go look at and say like, oh, wow, like this is really awesome. Um, and you can share it around and, and propagate it to other people. And especially people being able to look at this in mobile. Um, and then, you know, people being able to kind of see the bid history and so on. Um, then this might cause, this might be kind of like a newsworthy thing in the sense that like, if you see this and you're like, oh, wow, I can't believe like somebody is going to um, uh, pay 2.4 ETH for this, uh, you might tweet this out. And so then that attracts other people and whatnot. So I think like there's something about making the art visible and maybe making the auction itself very visible in a high quality way that made the NFT market work. Um, and so I think, well, that was interesting. Um, so I think in the same way, um, I think what kind of certificates of impact need is something like that, that makes these kind of things visible. I also think it's probably the case that a profile that collects the certificates of impact that you've generated or, or hold and so on uh, might be really valuable the same way. Uh, again, I think the NFT auction houses are doing this for art, uh, but certificates of impact might do it for, for good works. Uh, cool. Th so, thank you, yeah. that's really helpful. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, somebody, uh, Alejandra asks, can we talk to it? Uh, Alejandra, do you want to talk? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, if it's, a, if it's okay. Um, so actually, I think like Luke will understand why. So it's like, I totally like spawned what I was going to be doing. So I'm a rookie. I'm very green at all things dev. Um, so, but didn't want to take the risk after reading an article that he kindly shared about like tips and recommendations what to do. Um, although I didn't write a line of code for my last idea. Yeah. I think I'll just leave that one aside and what else can I do with what's in this one? So, and so I, I, I actually, I was like blown away between like, like the Sora, like also from last year, I just discovered earlier today, like the uh, poly wrap. And I was just like, wow, <laughs> like, that's awesome. So it's like, cause I was already thinking how to not to be very ambitious, but I may be able to do something even more ambitious just because that's already set up. Uh, but what I mean with that is like, I was thinking like live peer, um, like live auctions. So it's like have a live auction of the artist. Um, I'm a degenerate a lover, not in art, but in just unlocking and having the payment system like with Superfluid. So, uh, and I was going to do it alone. It's my second hackathon. Um, I, I, I'm kind of like, oh, I want to build something. So, but will you recommend that I do it with a team? What's best? Uh, I mean, it's, it's really up to you. Um, I mean, I think, uh, um, I think you can have a lot of impact by uh, either building something sooner with a team that is more skilled and the kind of 
building a thing or by taking the time to learn. So, so don't shy away from learning. So you can yeah. take one hackathon yeah. to build a thing for yourself, by yourself, learn a lot through it. And then the next time around, or when you start a new project or whatever, you'll, you'll be that much closer to, uh, to being able to, to do it. So it really sort of depends on, on, uh, on kind of what you want out of it. If, you, if your goal is to kind of, towards the end of the hackathon, have something that's like working as a product for, for people to use and so on, then yeah, I would probably recommend like working with a team. But um, if you if the goal is to learn, like then then just do it by yourself and or kind of share what you're doing, write about it. So um, mm-hmm. I think that people learn a lot is as they're um, working on things as in the encounter challenges. Sometimes they kind of like write down their own notes either for themselves or as blog posts, mm-hmm. and kind of help that helps them process and um, distill learnings from from that. Cool. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Thank you for, for that. So it's like, yeah, I want to learn because it's like for me right now, it's like, okay, I want to at least do that front end back. If I don't get to the back end, at least if I do front end development, I'll be like, oh yeah, I did it. <laughs> yeah, totally. And you know, think of all of the artifacts that you make as mm-hmm. really valuable, right? So think of like the design of the front end that you do as just like a mock-up as, as like interesting and valuable. Think of like the translation of that into, into code and CSS and so on as valuable. Think of the connectivity as valuable. And so if all of that stuff you kind of post out, out there, um, then other people can build on it and, and then it might make it make it into a thing or you might return to it later and, and so on. And you're learning from it, other people are learning from it. And you know, it's more likely that, that people will, um, that you or somebody else might, might build something like that for them. So thank you, Luke. And I haven't slept much because I had to like be thinking and learning all the others, but thank you for the article. <laughs> And thank you, Juan, for the advice as well. Yeah, cool. All right, cool. So other questions. Any thoughts on AR filters using NFTs, a platform where you can create, trade, and use AR filters using NFTs? That's super interesting. Yeah, probably add that to the list somewhere. Um, where might there be cool stuff around AR? Yeah, I don't know. AR is in here. Not yet, so cool. I like just added somewhere. Yeah, cool. So let's go through some of these. Um, yeah, let's start from the bottom this year. Uh, so, hey, social media. Um, and by, let me know if this is too, I should increase the font size, probably should increase the font size. Yeah, so social media apps are, are always like super interesting for people. And by the way, this is meant to be super interactive. So as you come up with thoughts or ideas, don't be shy and like jump in and, uh, talk through it. Uh, we're all working through this together. Marketplace is a centralized app store. Yeah, that, that would be super awesome. So I think like right now it is, um, you know, kind of there's like hard distribute. Like it's, it's hard to distribute um, Web3 and crypto oriented stuff uh, to users because there's no kind of like proper Web3 app store. Um, it'd be really, really cool to have a decentralized app store. Um, it also might be really valuable long-term because today the world is sort of controlled by two <laughs> to app store so like all of the superpowers that you might think of uh, deploying to the world have to be agreeable to two companies in some specific jurisdictions and if they don't like it you know too bad uh and that that really sucks so it might be it might be great to have a decentralized app store and you could do all of the distribution of the content like the the assets the, the binaries and so on through through Bitcoin. NFT for art on IPFS and Dexcom and Pathfind. NFT to provide ownership to a file. Yeah, super cool. Discover, discovery of the gamified collaborative platform. NFT to trace and document real world assets. Example use case would be cars, vehicles, and so on. Yeah, totally. I think I think there are a few things like this. I think um, I don't haven't seen any that have like really taken off yet. Um, I think another one that is probably uh, going to be really valuable is 
uh, real estate. So like NFTs uh, for real estate markets. You know, like when, when will be like the first uh, NFT auction for houses and stuff like that? I don't know, maybe that happened already. I missed it. Uh, by the way, real estate markets, I think it's going to be a huge thing for uh, Web3. Um, I think it's an area where like it's super not developed yet. Um, and it's super open for a lot of people to uh, to develop stuff. And there's a lot of countries in the world that really need better real estate markets where crypto might be super, super, super helpful. Option data storage, uh, random things, offline first, medical data. Yeah, so it turns out like medical data can be pretty big. Um, you just have to make sure that you encrypt it really well because um, you know medical data is super super private and and personal and so on. Um, so make sure is that you this, get the encryption right. Is this a open discussion? Sorry, that's yep. the medical data yes. was my thing. So one hundred percent. All right, cool. Um, I actually have like a small PowerPoint, but I'm just going to not go through it for you. <laughs> it's too much. Thank you. Uh, post it, post it uh, in, the in the chat somewhere uh, for people and, and add it as a link. So you can you can add it as a link here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I need to upload it then. But um, yeah, so basically I've been um, self-taught and I've worked with data scientists and look at radiology images. Uh, basically, the infrastructure in medicine is really fragmented it's different from like let's say the west coast uh, california has its like own internal system compared to like chicago or new york and um this has like a lot of um problems for like let's say you develop ai because um i worked with data scientists they want to develop machine learning for uh, computer vision images data version control was a big problem for us. Um, you know, they used Google Drive to upload images and then images were missing from, you know, the CT scan. So there's like, um, basically I, for a year, I hacked in other challenges where I'm trying to develop a platform of open source microservices to just handle uploading data for users or uh, like a healthcare system could like pay into the platform to upload data in like a, a microservices structure, but storage is really a big problem is that, you know, a medical image um, every year could be hundreds, like just hundreds of terabytes and <laughs> the cost is really high. And there isn't like a, I, I would say like a pipeline of developers really building that infrastructure out. So like, I, I focus on the infrastructure part a lot, but like the idea itself is just like, really i'm writing some javascript and python to query data and put it into like web3 and that's it really so like that should be just be the simplest idea but um yeah i don't know it's open yeah. discussion uh, if you want to say yes and to something yeah <laughs> totally. so i would say like um yes very much yes and like there's a there's a this is one of the, some of the most important and valuable data that people have and right now the platforms around it all kind of suck in that super hidden from users and so on um, and this varies a lot by country because there's different regulations of, and into kind of like what um, healthcare systems and healthcare, healthcare providers should do with data. In some countries, it's like the patients don't have access to it and only the hospitals do. In other jurisdictions, it's the opposite, like users have control and whatnot. Um, I think this is a perfect use case for Web3. It, it uh, makes the storage of that data verifiable and, and um, you can decide who to share with and so on, and encrypt everything out of rest and, and whatnot. Um, but it is kind of like a, like a hard project to get right. I would strongly encourage folks to think about um, doing the stuff in pieces and make it composable. So I think where, you know, one thing that's different from Web3 to Web2 is that um, in Web2 kind of like big platforms uh, were more successful. And like, if your platform did more and so on, you ended up kind of like um, uh, kind of growing faster and winning and whatnot. Um, my observation of Web3 is the opposite. It's that if things are small and composable and can be coupled together with others, then those things end up being more successful and grow over time. Um, and so if you get like a robust component that other people can build on, because it's all kind of like everyone's building Legos and so on, um, yeah. you know, highly encourage you to kind of think through not like a full platform, but think of like 
some like core component that, that could um, be useful and valuable, um, especially if you can unlock some economic mechanism there, like that might be super interesting because economic mechanisms is, you know, you get access to that in Web3. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I don't know. If yeah, that, that. that's why I want to do like a composable Docker image and just like keep it simple as possible and then throw the MIT license so people can like pick up and go because to like, let's say read HL7 data or DICOM files in the medical system, it's like, yeah. it's too much. <laughs> it is, you know, one, a, it is, a, it is an easy, you know? One interesting idea I might just be thinking about the certifications associated with medical data and mm -hmm. make those accessible in Web3 through like NFTs or other kinds of verifiable claim tools. Um, because all that stuff is like stuck in paperwork uh, and it'd be amazing if you made that computable uh, and you can turn that into oracles and you can turn that into um, things that people can like um, work with in smart contracts. Um, I don't know any certificates. So if anyone here knows what that's about, talk to me. <laughs> I'll try to help you program it. So yeah, that's all I got. That's medicine. Hey, uh, Johan, uh, can I uh, jump yeah, in? Yeah, I am PRC. Um, I am a big fan of you. So oh, pleased you. To, to finally talk with you uh, online. Um, it's, uh, I don't know if you remember, I built this sound a few years ago. Uh, it was the first uh, sound platform using IPFS. Cool. Uh, and I am here to uh, build the new uh, data layer for the sound. Uh, I picked the, a small chunk, as you said, and I want to build something to, um, to any social media. Uh, so it's, it's like a small protocol to uh, enable people to just uh, build social media for uh, Web3. Uh, I, I wanted to, I didn't want to, to talk about my project because it's not the goal here. Uh, um, I, I would like to talk about NFTs for intellectual property. Yeah. Because uh, I really think it's very important and uh, it's out of the scope for this hackathon. But if, if, no, if no one takes it, uh, maybe next year I will be here <laughs> developing that. Uh, I think it's really, really important for, uh, for the market um, to have something that musicians can rely on and they can... Uh, um, receive the, the values that they are owed by music, by the music they produce. And from my experience in the music industry, which is uh, a little bit, um, I really think that NFTs are being used the wrong way for music. Uh, NFTs should not be the music. Uh, the, the way I am planning to do that with this sound is, uh, Music is like like uh, um, common for everyone. Uh, anyone can listen. Anyone can uh, do whatever. And rights to use that music in other products or uh, publishing or uh, synchronizing with video or uh, uh, show using that music in a bar or something like that. That's the the, the monetizable thing. Uh, or merchandise like a CD. A CD is like a, uh, something that you collect, right? So that's the collectible, right? Uh, not the music itself. And that's, the, that's something that I want to bring here because there are a lot of people, creative people around this, uh, this, this call. And uh, if, if, I, if I can bring uh, this idea further and someone picks it up, uh, it would be really cool and I would use it on this sound. Um, because I really think it's very important that people stop using NFTs and, and art as the, the, the integral part of the NFT. No, NFTs are collectibles and they are used to monetize fan bases, not to monetize the content itself, okay? Um, I, I, I wanted to uh, yeah. learn about your thoughts uh, yeah, around this, this, uh, this, this topic. Yeah, I, 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 um, yes, and I, I think it'd be 
this is sort of like what I was getting at with the NFTs as productive assets. You, you need to be able to kind of pass along the right of um, using that piece of work um, and ideally kind of have a royalty structure where, you know, again, like if the, if the thing is used in a lot of other works, then kind of like the royalties flow. Uh, so here's like a, a few ideas, right? So one is um, if you create like a, like a tool on the web where you can kind of upload uh, samples and all of these samples are, are NFTs, like audio samples, and someone kind of like remixes a sample there using those NFTs, mint, mints that as an NFT, but you preserve the connectivity there, you can start building networks of, um, of value flows and royalties with that artwork, right? So imagine kind of like making the first composable audio NFTs that could be where you can remix the, the audio and trace the, the contributions over time. And I think that's how we, we build, you know, these kind of like economic flow um, flows across all of the, all of these uh, um, all of these things. Uh, I'd probably also add that uh, this might be relevant also in the um, visual NFTs too. Like think of um, being able to create like this, this thing that I was describing around, you know, creating like a, a room with art inside of it, either two D or three D art. Um, that's kind of similar. So think of like an audio track that has includes a bunch of samples, so similar to a room that includes a bunch of free objects. Um, and that these kind of kind of trace the, have like the NFT uh, graphs as well. Um, and kind of like trace the royalties and over, over time build like this, these networks of, of collaboration. Um, and I think part of what's, uh, what's gonna get there is kind of like establishing that you do move the, the rights alongside. And so doing some of the legal work of figuring out like what license should that be and you know, mark some NFTs as not just providing this collectible associated with the art, but actually providing the rights associated with the license um, and doing the work to figure out what, what that would look like. And, and maybe creating a platform where like you can remix audio NFTs. And you know, when you you imagine having like a like a playground where you have a bunch of samples and you can you can use one of the many open source tools out there for remixing audio, and then you and you know, say publish and you publish back to the platform. <laughs> And that kind of like mints an NFT for you with the audio and the modified audio, um, and then tracks the contribution graph. Like that, I think that would be super cool. Like an entire kind of authoring and publishing structure with like this all this royalty structure built in. Um, uh, could I add something really quick? Yeah, go for it. Hey, so uh, yeah, PRC, I actually um, <laughs> was uh, DMing you in the Discord about this. So I guess good to meet you, but. Uh, uh, this is actually what I'm uh, working on for this hackathon. I was telling you all about it. Um, so, I mean, if anyone uh, is interested, I'm still looking for people to work with um, on the kind of NFT uh, IP, like music IP idea. Um, so definitely reach out to me. I can drop my Discord in the chat. Um, and uh, yeah, I would love to get like maybe any uh, React developers, um, any designers that are still looking for a team or anything like that would be awesome. Yeah, Max, and 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 as I told you, uh, if you want some some input from me, just go ahead and uh, ping me because uh, that's that's something that really interests me, and uh, I am willing to help. If not, I'm I cannot join your team because I'm doing something else. But uh, of course, I can get some input uh, from my experience. Great. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, I'll drop my Discord for anyone else looking for a team still. I think I see a few hands, so I think uh, uh, I'll keep a stack. So Huxwell, uh, Shannon, hey. and then Jose. So Huxwell, go for it. Um, yeah, so you went a bit through our ID earlier, it's discovery. Uh, so we had this idea where we would build a platform that answers to the answer, uh, that answers to the question you get uh, a lot of the time. That is, where do I start my uh, web free journey or uh, as a user, where do I start my crypto journey? And so we thought about a platform where projects can collaborate with content creators to create courses. Um, but as you mentioned, that it, it would be best to have something composable and build uh, small pieces. Um, our first step is building this collaborative platform where uh, the official members of a protocol 
can uh, like review content from a content creator. So I came up with this idea of using a Git book and creating a GitHub action that uploads all the content of the course um, to Filecoin. And also I'm generating um, an NFT uh, based on those files plus the, the commit. Uh, and then the plan is, is to reward the the contributors of a pull request and also the reviewer, let's say. Um, so I, I'd like to have a bit of feedback regarding that. If if we should more focus on, on this specific part for the hackathon, as I see that like collaborative uh, tools are are having a lot of interest, or, or rather uh, focusing on the end end user. Uh, app. I think um, these kinds of tools are super, um, super useful. I think I'll, there's a lot of, look, I think you'll probably find users on both, both sides. Um, I would maybe prioritize getting to like a core simple product that you think people can like use end to end and kind of shift that. Um, and whether that's kind of like more on the collaboration side or, um, or not, it's kind of like up to you to, to sort of figure out. Um, and I think the, the uh, yeah, I think like the idea of like kind of rewarding writing, uh, running contributions, I think could be could be super useful. Um, also think of like, you know, the idea of hypertext for the web, uh, you know, came even long before the web, many decades before the web, through um, Ted Nelson Sanadu, and even before that, like the mimics, all of that was about text and uh, tracing the relationships between citations and text. So it came from like weaving somebody's writing, referencing somebody else's writing and kind of figuring out the graph of attribution um, and being able to kind of jump from one document to another kind of through some computational medium. And like, that's what gave, gave us hypertext and then the web and so on. So think of like, yeah, that, that kind of stuff is still uh, there's still a lot of ideas there that I think could be could be super interesting and valuable. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, especially if you have find really good ways of rewarding um, contributions to uh, to creative works, I think uh, that that kind of stuff is like um, there's a lot there. Yeah, uh, and and not only it could work for uh, like a Git book repo, but any any code repo basically because we are just uh, grabbing the files and generating an NFT based on on the files. So. It could uh, reward any open source open source uh, project. Yep, sounds good. So uh, I okay. think thanks I'm a lot. Can I go for the next person? I think Shannon. I think Shannon was asking about is anyone working on contribution graphs? Uh, do you want to say more? Hey, sorry. Um... Yep. I mean, not too much more context than that. I was just curious. I came in late to the call and heard that being referenced. Um, my team's working on a DAO Discord bot um, that's trying to help communities identify and manage information that's relevant to good governance. And obviously, reputation lies behind that. So I was just curious yeah, if other people are thinking about that. Yeah, this, that's awesome. Um, I think I think this is super timely. I think uh, there's a lot of uh, projects, or there's a lot of ideas, a few projects on in this kind of area, but I think a lot of it is still kind of tinkering around. Nothing has become super widely used yet. Um, I think I don't know how many other folks in HackFS are working on this stuff, but I'll mention a few um, projects uh, around contribution graphs. Uh, one of them is SourceCred, which is a project to for helping communities measure and work value. So think of being able to track a lot of contributions through a bunch of different kinds of things. So think, think like uh, GitHub and Discord and, and so on. Um, and there's a lot of tools that the social community has built over time to kind of ingest the contributions from all these different sources um, and then kind of come up with like some scoring. Um, and then they, they also have kind of uh, ideas around uh, being able to kind of construct uh, value flows over those contribution graphs and measuring them over time and so on. It's a super rich community with a lot of um, uh, lot of ideas that you can you can kind of um, uh, look at. Uh, 
And another group, I think like the mirror community is, is doing a lot of really cool experimentation on this. Um, you can go to like dev.mirror.xyz, I think is the, uh, the website. Um, and you can see a lot of the stuff that they're doing um, with the public. And it's kind of like a publishing platform plus NFT auctions, plus writing, like it's sort of integrated to help make it easy to use. Um, but a lot of like really interesting components and so on are coming out. Um, those should all be kind of uh, usable um, more broadly than, than Mirror, I, I hope. Um, but, you know, things like splits are just a simple structure that like allows that kind of contribution graph. Um, split stream is, is kind of cascading splits through um, kind of the scientific publication graphs and, and so on. Um, and, I, and what I really sort of want to get to is like, whenever, you know, people are minting NFTs with creator addresses and so on, that should really be pointing to like some large distribution of, of work. Um, so not large distribution of like all of the groups that have been kind of involved with creating that thing. Um, so yeah, super, super, I think with a lot of this would recommend, um, again, building kind of composable primitives that, you know, maybe like just a simple tool where you can describe a um, kind of like a, like a group of people, a collaboration and kind of like who, all the collaborators and make that a composable thing that people can weave into other contracts. Um, That's super uh, cool, helpful. I think. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I think the next one was Jose. One second, I, I, I need to, can the next one can go because I got a yes. little. Baby, there it is. <laughs> okay. One sec. Uh, all right. Drama? Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, uh, so with respect to IPFS Filecoin uh, accessing directly, is there any way uh, some extension or anybody working on it uh, from the browser? I, I know that we can uh, access through uh, Flick or uh, you know the textile or other uh, bridges that they have, but in terms of onboarding and, and making that, dumping that content, uh, in the IPFS file can be smooth. Is there some extension from the browser side or we need to build a proxy server and do some kind of authentication uh, there? Yeah, so so um, you can uh, look at, so IPFS was designed to be able to be run within browsers. So if you go to JS, where are my browsers? So first of all, I'm running Brave, which ships with uh, Go IPFS node in it. So if you are running Brave, you can, look at oh. content. Um, so I can do like, I can go to like, um, let's do a p.io. I think this should work. Let's test it. Yeah, do you see, do you see the address here? The address is like, I can Did you, oh, did you put this it in the, the chat? Address. Oh, all right, I got you, yeah. IPNS, and like okay. That, yeah, and so like that's working. So this is pulling from from an IPFS um, address. Uh, let's see, so it says use a local node or use mobile gateway. So like, let's use a local node. Installing. Let's see how it goes. We're doing it live. Um, I have a yeah. This is a different. Oh no, bug. Okay, let's try using a public gateway. I, I'm running like a different different profile, so maybe um, maybe it's a profile issue. And so yeah, so I think this is using a public web uh, web gateway, but it's kind of like um, so like resolve the link. Um, let's see if I can open a. Different window and try one more time. But once I post it, I can view it. But I'm saying to be able to post first, right? I and mean, this is to be able to view um, the content which is already there. But I, I want to talk about, I'm talking about just being able to post it into the IPF, IPFS. Yeah, right? so I think you can, you get to use an API. Uh, so, and, and by the way, you can go to JS. But I, uh, by the way, it worked the second time, so it's great. Um, if you go to this this website, this is like the, the full implementation of IPFS in JavaScript. Okay. Um, and so this works within the browser. And so like here, this is like using JavaScript to you know kind of like run some of this content. And so you know I can say like, hello, hello, Hackathon. Um, I run that, and that gives me a different hash. And then I should be able to like look at it on the web. Let's see, will it? And this is supposed to connect to my browser. Sometimes, like the if I'm behind the NAT, it like won't work that well. 
yeah, I think it's like not not connecting. But um, the yeah, this is the content discovery is like a super annoying problem, and that's plaguing a lot of the applications. That's getting better over time. But um, this this is using IPFS within within the browser tab, and uh, you, you get to like kind of construct all the objects here, and then kind of uh, push them to the world. Uh, I recommend taking a look at Proto School, um, which kind of goes into source of IO. Yeah, let's see. Oh, Proto that's cool. Cool. And okay. you can look at this, you can look at the tutorials that have to do with IPLD and IPFS, and these will tell you these are all built with IPFS directly on JavaScript. And so you can like um, but, yeah. change stuff directly directly on the web. Yeah, I think as somebody also commented, Slit also enables uploading from browser. Yeah, that, that's true yep. too. Okay, thank thank you. Cool, awesome. All right, Jose, uh, are you are you ready now? Sure. <laughs> yeah, it's just a perfect time. Yeah, thank you, Juan. Um, yeah, sure. So I'm I'm currently working on a um, trying to tag, tackle the angle of social media, and right now the challenge that I'm currently having is whether uh, I should be just using something like smart contract to index the contact directly. Um, or whether uh, it might make sense to use something like IPFS. And the challenge on using something like IPFS for particular content comes on, on you know, what layer should should I interact with, right? So should should I use something directly like an IPFS public gateway or maybe leverage in some of the existing projects that are doing something like, you know, ceramic, um, there's textile, there's web storage, right? So it's it's hard to identify what is the, the best base layer on in interacting with an IPFS. So any any particular recommendations based on your experience or what you have seen in previous hackathon? Uh, I would say that a lot of these tools are, um, so, so a lot of these tools are have active developer teams and so they're building them now and improving them. And so I would say if I was familiar with any of them, they've like probably changed quite a bit by now and, and improved. So I, I encourage you to kind of like try them, look at the demos that people are showing and then try using them and then see how they go. Um, and it maybe depends on what you're trying to do, right? So uh, for example, uh, NFT to storage is kind of tuned for helping you store NFTs. And so if you're, if you're gonna like store a bunch of NFTs, NFT to storage might be like the easiest way for you to do it. Um, and kind of like that's kind of tuned for NFT app, apps and, and platforms and so on. Um, if you uh, are gonna store kind of like simple uh, kind of like files and and application data, uh, and you want like the simplest possible API to 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 use it. Um, you know, web three storage might be might be a good fit. Um, if you uh, and like that launched now, like launched like this week for for HackFS. Um, and then I think you know things like ceramic can be really useful when you also start wanting to create documents that will be kind of like shared with other folks, and you want to carry identity and be able to kind of reason about. The who's editing what. Um, also, um, want to plug Textile Threads for this kind of use case as well. Uh, Textile has a, a, a ton of like really awesome tooling for uh, for doing this as well. Um, and there's kind of like some amount of integration between between these, um, like in the in the lower level data structures. Uh, so I would I would just encourage you to kind of experiment with a few, try them out, um, and then kind of like see what's like easiest for your for your service and for your for your application, and then um, kind of like use that and stay nimble and that like, you know, this can, the, the space will evolve over time and, um, you know, you can kind of refactor things over time. And there's probably a whole bunch of others that I'm not mentioning. Like there's, you know, I think Fission and um, right. Fleek and, and many others. Uh, right, awesome, perfect. Thank you, everyone. Uh, can, can I uh, bounce uh, on that? Yeah, go for it. Uh, so like for, in our example, uh, what we are planning to do is for the files of the courses, let's say the videos that last more than ha one hour or something, we are planning to upload them through webfree.storage. But then we are going to compose an object that contains just the URLs for those files. And we are going to store that object on um, nft.storage. And then we have kind of our uh, main data storage layer where we structure things and we use ceramic for that. At least that's what we're planning to do now. But I feel like there's still um, kind of a layer missing that, that would make the link between some entities like uh, having some relationship or something like that. 
but I guess th that's something we need to figure out uh, how long uh, while we're building those tools. Yeah, that sounds, sounds good to me. All right, I have a few hands. So uh, let's see, uh, Chachindra, I think. Yeah. Uh, hi, Juan. Uh, really nice to meet you here. And, uh, I just want to really? discuss something uh, that you I, I Can you hear me? Hello? Yep. Yes. Okay. So I just, just coming back on the, on the original rule that you said about, and yes, and. I just want to get your opinion on, on the usage of NFTs. I mean, there have been uh, people talking about uh, the right way of using NFTs and, and there are like certain ways where you have to have build metaverses and, and asset to a particular song or something. So when the inherent idea of NFT being that this could be sold or this could be monetized in some way or one when you're on it. But um and and, and just uh, my idea is something on creating some kind of a review so that you could like give a review about a website, the kind of content it has or any kind of like a software, um something something like on that on a decentralized uh, uh, on the network. Um, posting that as an NFT. So do you really feel that this uh, publishing anything as an NFT is like uh, is a good way to proceed with things and then tinker out how this pans out in the end? Or, or do you feel like it's an overcomplicated way to record uh, some valuable data and just because you can create an NFT? Should you really do it in that way? Or, or there are multiple ways to kind of do this? Um, I mean, I think, uh... Uh, I think a lot of it sort of, I think it probably depends on the approach uh, in the, that you want to take. I don't know, it, it's a lot of kind of like product specific. Um, so um, if somebody else kind of like jumps, has like a, like a good idea and like a good response, like happy to take it, I would um, think of approaching it in a, a few different directions. Sorry, I'm like my, my brain is not being super useful for you right now. Um, I mean, I mean, just uh, trying to get a hold of like, there are certain ways, uh, there are certain uh, uh, use cases where NFTs are the best use case, but are there certain use cases that you've come across which don't um, seem like a best way of usage of NFTs? Are there any that you've come, up with, come across that we should like avoid while we are designing our solutions? No, I mean, I think, look, I think at the end of the day, all this an NFT is, is a, an on-chain record of, or like a certificate of something on the chain, right? Like that's, right. think of it as like um, internet native property, right? It's like, it's a way of defining some piece of property on the web. And there's a little bit of information that describes the property and that's it. And NFTs only have value as long as people agree that they have value, similar to kind of property in the physical world, right? Like the idea that somebody owns land is really just kind of like a convention that people have come up with and, agreed upon and written down into legal agreements and you know there it's enforced by laws but you know like that's you know physics has nothing to do with that um, and so with similar with nfts it's just a record and a certificate on chain that that represents something so they're super flexible um, and they're super usable for all kinds of things i think the, the thing you want to be wary of is right now chain scalability isn't amazing yet um, people are working on this I believe there's a lot of groups working on helping the chain scale and be a lot cheaper to, to deploy content to. Um, so I think a lot of the really exciting NFT use cases will appear once chain scale much better when you can like just publish, you know, trillions of NFTs uh, and kind of like record assets for all kinds of things. Um, and you can weave them into all, all kinds of components. But I, I would kind of like not, yeah, I don't think there's any kind of like necessarily like wrong way of using them. I would just say it's a certificate like any other and it kind of like matters what you put into the certificate. Like, what are you kind of really certifying? Um, so for most art NFTs right now, it's just, it's a collectible that you you get to kind of have, but it doesn't confer any rights. Um, I think these will, this, this will change over time. Similar to kind of, kind of how when you buy a painting, uh, you don't buy like an image of the painting, you buy the actual physical object. And by buying the physical object, that means that you get, you get to like display it in a gallery or, give it to a museum or like move it around or something like that. And I think that'll, that'll happen with, with, uh, with digital NFTs as well. Um, it'll just take some time. Awesome. Um, just uh, a really quick, um, update, uh, just a really quick answer I would like to have. Uh, there, I, I think there's one more use case where they're talking about archiving content, the web two content 
uh, just like websites or uh, any um, uh, asset which is on the web to to web three, like they could have like archive.org or something of that sort. Um, so I just wanted to know, like, when you are archiving this in an automatic fashion, um, also uh, using a browser extension of some sort. Like we are also trying to do the same thing. Um, are there like certain ways uh, or certain certain checklists that we should be careful of, like uh, uploading or archiving something which is like authenticated or maybe something which is owned by a particular user and then now it's been public yeah. to or you you have something archived something which is, was behind a paywall and now it's open to everyone. So are yeah, these so certain would, things we should avoid? You should be careful. Sorry. So you should be careful with with content licensing. So yeah, great that you bring that up. So um, a lot of content on the web is open access and you can move it around as you want. Some content on the web has specific licenses that regulate how you're able to make copies and so on. Um, and so I would just be careful around content like that. And so check, check the licenses associated with the content that you're looking at. Um, not all content is clear and obvious. Um, a lot of it sort of depends on the platform, um, but there's a lot, a ton of content out there that is totally open access. So we just kind of recommend, so first of all, reward openness by building your apps over open content and like encourage a lot of, of kind of that, that distribution of content. Um, but also um, you, can, you, you can use non-open content or like content with different licenses. And you may, may want to think about representing that as NFTs. And so, you know, you can think of like creating NFT templates for like the different kind of um, license, licenses associated with this or creating platforms that respect those or something like that. And, and I would say, like, be careful with anything that is super sensitive private information. So a lot of the Web3 content, um, because the net, the chains are so public and uh, and it's such an open environment, um, a lot of libraries and so on are not tuned for super private content. So if you're going to handle super sensitive private data, just make sure you get the encryption of that right. Or, like, do your demo without kind of, like, anyone with synthetic data, not with, like, any anybody with actual data until you get that audited super carefully because you don't want to accidentally publish somebody's private, super private information and then make it like really difficult to take down. Uh, Makes sense, yeah. Good. Thanks. Uh, cool, now uh, Morgan. Hey, how's it going? Just want to say uh, really, really, really big fan of what you're doing, Juan. Uh, code magician over there and uh, running these sessions. I. I align a lot with the values that uh, you espouse with the rest, and uh, just want to say, really happy to be here. Um, Thanks a lot, and thank you for being here. And thank like all of us are are uh, good magicians. So build the future. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, building the future all together. Um, yeah, I posted a, an idea, a concept that I was exploring in the uh, in the page there under E. Um, I guess for the starting starting point, what you were mentioning related to the what was it under? Is, Sorry, I missed I missed the the uh, what thing you were. Uh, yeah, I put it under uh, DAPS and then DAPS for legal jurisdiction or ritual for legal jurisdiction. I don't know if that's the right place to put it, but um, I just I guess at the start just wanted to say the the concept of these auction houses providing negative payments to people is like a really, really cool concept up to a certain point. Just curious uh, if you had any examples or like an easy way for that to occur, whether yeah, it's just yeah. like a, a straight NFT transfer and then like all those that own it as partial owners and then sort of start to get assets or like funds being flowed to them. I guess that's just like the sort of the space. Yeah, point. I mean, I think, look, I think um, at the moment, and very sorry to mute, I think I'm getting some background noise from. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, so the the idea here is like because right now the Filecoin network's capacity um, and the sort of verifiable storage that's in it um, have a large, large gap between them, it means that you can kind of flow um, negative pricing. And so I think that this could be used to fund all kinds of organizations that do really valuable work protecting and safeguarding data. So I would almost like, the fact that like, we know that this is possible means that we can go and create a product that maybe tunes for um, giving this like super valuable resource to groups that really need it. So think of like creating some platform for helping fund um, 
groups that collect and safeguard data uh, that are, is really has important value to communities. Um, and think of like that negative pricing as a way to fund the, the, the active maintenance of that data and funnel the people that usually do a lot of this work um, and, and you know, tragically underpaid, right? So tons of like important valuable data commons work just goes unrewarded. And so think of like this negative pricing as a way of like, at least for now, while this, <laughs> this structure exists, uh, be able to flow some of the some of the platform block reward over to to um to those users. Yeah, that's really cool. The uh, the concept I'm exploring is a little bit of an experiment, not so much deal, but from personal experiences, I've found that uh, doing types of meditative or ritual experiences as it relates to using frequencies as a sort of sound bath or a way to let's say align a person's mental well being is something that I'm looking to explore. And uh, the concept is trying to, I guess, build like a really small use case, almost like you can think of it like flashcards for like gestures that people can contribute to and all kind of start to align around, um, I guess, the same type of rhythms and um, sort of techno spiritual uh, representations all aligning together, um, possibly all connected using brain to machine interfaces. And I'm wondering if um, using this would be like a good use case for the auction house example, where let's say like you have a starting point of like people begin as a sort of starting ground. And then as they start to invite other people, you can then start, you know, aggregating people together in a way that then can sort of facilitate free storage of whether it's just like brain computer interface data flows or um, I guess just like snapshots of people you know, all together, like, for example, all of us together on this on this call, it's like taking a snapshot at certain points and then selling that as like proof of participation on like the Polygon network or something like that. Yeah, it, I mean, um, I don't, like, I would, I think there's a lot in what you described. I would encourage you to either create some kind of prototype that makes it, I, I don't fully kind of um, rock what you're describing. Um, I would encourage you to kind of make a prototype or something like that through the hack or, or think of like a, some components. Like it could be that some of the components could be done. So for example, you could think of creating a 3D environment where you place a set of people together and you're able to kind of have some shared experiences over, over the network. So right now, I think um, most uh, experiences on the web are split between kind of like 2D interaction, mostly through text and a little bit of video or mm -hmm. fully immersive games. And there's kind of like no in between and like, there's no good way of like hanging out with people online in kind of like a 3D environment. And it could be that like NFTs plus a 3D environment that you can decorate plus really high quality multiplayer audio streams is all you need. And once you kind of like allow people to create a, so for example, here's another idea. Like it'd be really cool to be able to kind of design a 3D room and get some NFTs and decorate my space with like those digital artifacts um, and then be able to kind of invite people to hang out in that physical space. So think of kind of like spatial plus like highly uh, decorative environments. Uh, I think a lot of the platforms out there that have done a lot of this AR VR kind of work have struggled to make really high quality environments because they just don't have the approach that game studios have of crafting super high quality experiences. Um, and yet uh, the NFT world has managed to produce some extremely high quality art because it kind of like rewards art better. Um, and so maybe these things can be coupled where like imagine having like a, like a, an environment, I think Spatial is probably already doing this with um, letting you decorate the spaces with NFTs uh, or if they're not like they should totally be doing it. Um, and, but, but I think like still Spatial is kind of like a full platform. It's kind of difficult to get into and whatnot. Uh, I would love to be able to kind of create a link, create, you know, mess around with kind of some voxels and construct a room and then add some objects into it, mint that as an NFT, and then be able to invite people to go hang out and experience that environment together. Yeah, I think that'd be super, super cool. And once you have that as a composable primitive, you can then start coupling rooms together with like portals and doorways and whatnot. Uh, and you can like build the, build the metaverse that way. I, I think that's really cool. I actually wanted to use the Connect Xbox One uh, visual camera as like a starting point, as like a proof of concept for just like an actual virtual or physical space and go that route as opposed to going from the, the metaverse, like sort of like 
starting physical, then going to the metaverse, as opposed to going to the metaverse into the physical. So um, yeah. that was a thought. Super, super cool. Yeah, good, good luck with the hack. Cool, thank um, you very much. Constantin? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you as well, John, from my side. And you got pretty accurate on the description of, of what we are planning to do for this hackathon, personally. So we are exactly trying to bridge this gap of the art galleries of the physical world and artists of NFTs. And what we see as a potential opportunity is that there are a lot of art places physically in the world which would love to extend their galleries to the uh, uh, VR exhibition, for example, but they have the lack of know-how or the lack of technology or both sometimes. So that this is, we already developing quite a huge push within the uh, NFT art itself, but it's not exposed to the majority of people. And we want to enable the art galleries to create something on their own through, the, through our platform, either creating as a VR space, or even as you had a great idea of uh, providing also the VR space as a minted uh, 3D object, which is sounds super great and we'll explore, explore it on that topic. But what I wanted to ask is, is there anything else that comes to your mind when we are speaking about VR and uh, uh, Web3 or distributed networks? Is there something missing? Because I see there might be a lot of potential on also distributed storage as 3D spaces might wait a lot. Or is there something else as, an, as a topic that we can look at? Yeah, I mean, so the 3D, so, so think of like, um, this is kind of why we built NFT.storage and, and Web3.storage because um, it's kind of like a, like, a sim, like a useful aggregator service that's tuned for NFTs um, and can do all of the heavy lifting of backing all of it up and kind of storing it back on and whatnot. Um, and that gives you, I think it's right now at 32 gigabytes per NFT. And if you run into like problems with that size, I think like talk to the team, I think that they, um, you know, like 30 gigabytes is a lot, right? Like, I don't think um, that's kind of like enough for like full length movies and high resolution and so on. So um, that should be more than, than you need for 3D spaces, unless you're like minting a massive world. Um, so like, you can probably do like whole like Minecraft levels in that size. Um, so by the way, Minecraft in like, a, so, so I think CryptoVoxel is a really cool, cool idea. I would love to see kind of even more composable versions of that, like start constructing, like make it super easy, like construct objects with voxels, mint out of NFT, and then piece this together into larger and larger and larger environments. Um, yeah, thank you for the take on. Uh, just one more question. Uh, do you think uh, we are on the stage yes. where uh, we are on the level of development where we should enable everyone to create their own like visual spaces for the galleries or it should be more of like an art direction where someone takes it as a leading role for, as a designer and then we give it as a full solution to the customer of a gallery, for example? I think right now um, the space is evolving so quickly and a lot of things are being tried, I would encourage you to kind of have a, a good end-to-end -end solution quickly and put it out there to see what people make out of it and make it composable. So whatever you do, make it something that like, it's not like a, necessarily a full platform, but it's something that other people can use to build on. And I think that's gonna make it more, more likely to be, be part of something larger. Um, so for example, if you can like construct a gallery, uh, um, you, can, you can separate the components of, designing the physical space and creating the, the kind of like 3D environment and make that like a tool or a product. And then a different tool and product uses a 3D space and allows people to show up um, into that 3D space together and have like a, a shared experience. Because, you know, art is a lot about experience and, and um, experiencing that art together with other people. And so creating that experience on the web like doesn't quite work yet. And I think it would be super cool to do it in a VR pointed way or something like that. Um, and you can think of that like as a separate application or product that kind of like you compose the, you can like plug in like the, the specific rooms and whatnot. Um, and then you can think of like the, you, you can think of like being able to hold a public event at this gallery that has been composed and being able to charge admission for that public event and use that admission price 
to reward all of the parties that have provided that put art in that gallery. So imagine like you have um, a bunch of NFTs being displayed in like a 2D gallery space, like you know 2D art or 3D art in like a 3D gallery space that you can view together. You create like an event and you can charge admission and you can then have move the economic flow of all of that to reward the creator of the space, the creator of all the art, and and then you know kind of like and all the holders of those those NFTs. And so like you can create those kind of flows and, and I think you can go from those galleries into full scale museums and then you can have like like a full experience of kind of gathering and experiencing art together online and rewarding that creation of the art over time. And and also the curators are gonna select which art pieces go into what what pieces. Oh, and by the way, like one big part of art is installations. So it's not just about the 2D piece or the 3D piece, but it's how that's composed with other pieces of art and how that room plays into it. So imagine rewarding that part of the art process as well. So like all of those components I think are, but again, I would encourage you to like think of pieces and make all of these composable things that you can do separately. And like that, because you don't know what's gonna really take off and, and what's gonna be composed with something else. And the space is just moving so, 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 so fast that I encourage you to like, do something smaller and simpler, put it out there, make it usable, and then build the next one. Perfect. Thank you a lot for that. Just a small uh, advi uh, request for advice. If we already see that there are solutions that create this visual gallery, should we go with them for the first time? Or should we also try to replicate it as the solution is not open source or I cannot use it as a... Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, it really depends on the specific group. Like if it's not open source, that, like, that's kind of frustrating. It depends on like how much work it is to replicate. Um, I tend to be very strongly for using kind of open source software and, and so on, uh, because that makes it much more composable with other things. Um, software that's kind of licensed in a way that where you can't, when the thing you make can't quite be used with other things, like that's, that kind of harms your software. So I would just be careful about that. Um, it, it really is a trade-off. It depends on how much time you have. Maybe start with start using it if that's easier for you. And then later on, think about replacing it. Perfect. Thank you a lot for the insights. Thank you. And, um, and don't forget about the music. Uh, as a DJ, uh, is a very important part of an art gallery. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you to Juan. And I, I want to thank everyone else uh, for joining us today. It's been an excellent session. Um, I want to encourage everyone to continue the conversation in the Discord, but we're running up on time right now. Be respectful of everyone's time and, uh, you know, good luck taking these ideas and, and putting them into practice. I, I, I know I can speak for all of us and that we're really excited to see how things are going to be built this, this time around. So thank you again to everyone. We're going to be closing the stream here. Um, and again, again, thank you. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for sharing your ideas and thoughts. Thoughts with me.